ನಮೋ ತಸ್ಸ ಭಗವತು ಅರ್ಹತು ಸಂ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ನಮೋ ತಸ್ಸ ಭಗವತು ಅರ್ಹತು ಸಂ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ನಮೋ ತಸ್ಸ ಭಗವತು ಅರ್ಹತು ಸಂ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ಪೇ ಹು ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಟು ದ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಒನ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ಸ್ today june 6 2024 at damasuka meditation center so i would like to deliver dhamma talk sutra number 38 from majjhima nikaya moha tanha sankhaya sutta so i am going to divide i'm going to break up into three part three moha means greater maha plus tanha plus asankaya so maha means greater tanha means craving and asankaya means distraction the discourse means sutta means discourse so the greater discourse on the distraction of craving so this sutta actually the buddha deliver to the monks so during the buddha's times a monk named sati son of a fisherman so he was listening dhamma talk from the buddha about the dependent originations and what exactly said the buddha he did not understood he did not understand that way what the buddha said but he understand another way and he share whatever he understood he shared to others you know and when a few monks heard that he is going to explain about the consciousness the wrong way and they said venerable sati you should not explain about the consciousness like that to others he said no no whatever i am i understood this is the right this is the what the blessed one said this is the what the buddha said so the sati didn't listen them and those monks went to the buddha and they said venerable gotama buddha you know venerable sati he's explaining about the consciousness the wrong way we told him to stop it but he didn't listen us so a pernicious view arose in a monk named sati so i could it here as he said the sati said as i understand the dhamma taught by the blessed one it is this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the round of rebirths not another this is sati's explanation so when the few monks went to the buddha and complain about him and buddha said okay please call him I want to talk with him how he is going to explain. So a monk went to him said, Venerable Sir, Gautama Buddha call you. So he sati away, came to the Buddha and Buddha said, How do you understand about the consciousness? Could you explain me? And then he said, It is that which he speaks and feels and experiences here and here and there the result of good and bad actions and buddha said misguided man so what you explain this is not the right and buddha call all monks oh monks please come here listen what the sati said is not right 
I didn't explain that way. I said one dependent on another one. But he, he said, it is that which speaks and feels and experiences here and there the result of good and bad actions. I didn't explain that way. So, and Buddha explained in front of the Sangha, avijya pasaya sankara. Because of ignorance, formation arises. Sankara pasaya viyana. Because of the formation, consciousness arises. Viyana pasaya nama rupa. Because of the consciousness, name and form arise. Nama rupa pasaya salayatana. Because of the name and form, six bases arise. Salayatana pasaya paso. Because of the six sense bases, contact arise. Paso pasaya tanaha. Because of contact, craving arise. Tanaha pasaya upadana. Because of craving, Clinging arise. Tanna upadana pasaya bhavo. That means because of clinging, habitual tendency arise. And bhavo pasaya jati, because of habitual tendency, birth arise. Jara marana sukha paridava dukkha dumanasa payasi. And so on. So, first time he explained that way and second time he said cessation, niruda, just opposite. If not ignorance arise, formation not arising. If formation not arise, consciousness not arising. So, he explained that way, you know, very clearly. So, this would actually be a little bit long, long sutta, I don't know, it will, maybe it will take two hours, you know, so please, you have to, be, to pay attention, otherwise it will be very difficult to understand. So this is the first time I am giving this Dhamma talk in my Hmong life, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> So, Sutta number 38, but I just read one time, try to understand what the Sutta said. You know, after lunch, I tried the whole Sutta, what the Buddha talked about, you know. So, at the beginning said, Evam me sutang, thus have I heard, ekang samayang bhagava. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living Savatiyang Viharati Jathavane Anatha Pindika Sarame. At Savatti in Jatha's group, Anatha Pindika's park, that means Jathavana Monastery, which was donated by Anatha Pindika. Okay? Now, on that occasion, a Pernicious view had arisen in a monk named Sati, son of a fisherman. Thus, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the round of rebirths, not another. Several monks having heard, having heard about this, went to the monk Sati and asked him, Friend Sati, is it true that such a pernicious view has arisen in you? Exactly so, friends, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One. It is this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the round of rebirth, not another. Then those monks desiring to detach him from that pernicious view pressed and questioned and crossed 
questioned him thus, Friend Shakti, do not say so. Do not misrepresent the Blessed One. It is not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak thus. For in many ways the Blessed One has state consciousness to be dependently arisen. Since without a condition, there is no origination of consciousness. Yet although pressed and questioned and cross-questioned by those monks in this way, the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, is still obstinately adhered to that pernicious view and continued to insist upon it. Since the monks were unable to detach him from that pernicious view, they went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told him all that had occurred, adding, Venerable Sir, since we could not detach the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, from this pernicious view, we have reported this matter to the Blessed One. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain monk thus, Come monk, tell the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, in my name that the teacher calls him. Yes, Venerable Sir, he replied. And he went to the monk Sati and told him, Teacher calls you, friend Sati. Yes, friend, he replied, and he went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, sat down at one side. The Blessed One then asked him, Sati, is it true that a following pernicious view has arisen in you? As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is it is this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the round rebirths, not another? Exactly so, Venerable Sir, you see? Even he is talking with the Buddha like that. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the round rebirths, not another. What is that consciousness, Sati? Buddha asked him, Venerable Sir, it is that which he speaks and feels and experiences here and there the result of good and bad action. Then Buddha said, Misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stayed in many ways consciousness to be dependently arisen, since with their conditions there is no origination of consciousness. But you, misguided men, have represented us by your wrong grabs and injured yourself in a store of much demerit. For this will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. So here one thing you have to understand, you know, if you give Dhamma talk, you have to be very careful. If you give the wrong information to the public, to the, to the, to the lay people, you are in the danger. So what the Buddha said here? He said, you have misrepresented us. That means you are teaching wrong way. So that way you have unwholesome. Because of that you have to suffer. You may go to hell. Because what is Dhamma? You have said that one is not Dhamma. What is truth? You are saying that one is not truth. So you are committing offense. There are many monks in the world, you see, 
they are not reading the scriptures they are not reading the sutta and they are very famous everywhere people don't know Buddhism very well they just invite you and offer the dana offer the food and then monks say abhiva dana sile changni changutta pasayino sattaradama vadanti ayuvan no sukang bala then you say sadhu 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 finish that's all but lay people don't know dhamma very well because they are too busy about the family life they think oh monk know buddhism very well actually many monks don't know but they know what happening in the society so they mix and max you know exactly what the buddha said they don't pick up the from the tipitaka from the scriptures right so some people some monks they try to speak about the society not exactly focusing to the scriptures so that will also they commit offense let me tell you one story of what happened during the buddha's time during the kasava buddha during the kasava buddha's time not the gotama buddha one monk uh, that someone the the fisher who who catch the fish right one guy went to the river and he found beautiful and golden color fish so the fisherman was thinking wow i never find a fish like that before i want to present this fish to the king and king will be very happy he may give me some prize some he may give something to me because of happy happiness you know so he he got that golden fish and then he went to the king and offered to him and king was, was very happy after seeing that one but king was the buddhist he was thinking that oh i have to take this this fish to the buddha and he took that fish to the jatavana monastery and then in front of the temple monastery he put the fish and fish is doing like this moving his mouth when his mouth is moving like that bad smell is coming from his mouth and around the monastery became so bad a smell a spread and buddha used his psychic power he said so that the fish can speak with the buddha the king is there so after using his psychic power the buddha asked a few questions buddha said hey golden fish from where did you come he said i came from the heaven is uh, from hell i will see hell i will see the last one so from here where will you go i will go to i will see hell again where is your mother my, my mother also in i will see hell where is your brother my brother in i will see hell what is the reason because that golden fish when he was human being he was man he was buddhist man and he delivered dhamma talk what is truth he said not truth what is dhamma he said not dhamma so that way he explained to the people because of that unwholesome action he became fish 
But of course, when he was monk, he did some sort of chanting. This, those are the wholesome, right? And because of that, those wholesome, he became golden fish. You know? So after when the Buddha asked him a few questions, uh, he felt very insult, you know? And then his head hit with the floor, touch, 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 two, three times and then passed away. And again he went to the Avasya hell. So that's why whenever you deliver Dhamma talk, please be very careful. You are a good speaker, you can speak very well, you can speak very good English or good Bengali or good your language. But you have to be very careful when you give the Dhamma talk. This is very important. So that's why whenever I give Dhamma talk, I, if I don't know, I say I don't know. This one I learned from Bhikkhu Bodhi. Bhikkhu Bodhi is the very intellectual scholar, you know, and monk. So, I learned the Pali from him, I mean, many years ago. Now, because I am very busy, that's why I cannot attend. So, he said, many, many students ask him the questions about the Pali, you know, whatever he taught to us. So, they ask him the questions. He think about it. He said, I don't know. Then I was thinking. He's very intelligent monk. And then he said, I don't know. Some monk think that, oh, even though I don't, he doesn't know, but he, he think that I know. That is also danger, you know. Then I was thinking, wow, even the book, Bhikkhu Bodhi said, I don't know. So that way we can say, if I don't know, I don't know. If I know, I know. So that way you, you never break the precept. You want the right path. Right? So that's why we have to be very careful when we deliver Dhamma talk. You know. So Buddha said to him, misguided man, have I not stayed in many ways consciousness to be dependently arisen since without a condition there is no origination of consciousness but you misguided men have misrepresented us by your wrong grabs and injured yourself and stored up much demerit for this will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time this is danger for you so don't do that so that's why we need, if you become monk, monk should stay with the preceptor five years. At least five years. This is the Buddha said in the Vinaya. Otherwise you don't know Dhamma. And then people invite you. And you are talking, 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 but not from the Sutta. You are saying something from the outside, which is not in a scripture, which is not in the sutta. So that's why we have to be very careful about that. So the monk, a new monk, the who will take the full ordination, he must stay with the preceptor at least five years. So that way he will learn how to behave, he will learn the discipline, 227 rules, he will learn Dhamma, you know, and then when he will talk with the people, he know how to communicate with the people, and he knows how to share the Dhamma to them, you know. So for leading the people is not easy. I am leading almost 16 years. Sometimes I felt very difficult, still feeling difficult, you know. We cannot control the people. Some people like me, some people dislike me. 
but it's okay. Even during the Buddha's time, many people dislike the Buddha too, right? The few Brahmin came to the Buddha and asked a few questions him. And Buddha explained according to the word, what is true. And they didn't accept. Hmm. Okay, fine. And they left. Even they didn't respect him. The Buddha came back to the monastery and he said, Oh monks, you know, we met a Brahmin. He asked me a few questions, this and that. And I explained him according to my understanding, my attainment. And he didn't listen to me. And the Buddha explained in detail to the monks that one became one sutta. So all the suttas in the Diga Nikaya, Majjhima Nikaya, Sanyutta Nikaya, Angutra Nikaya, Kuddaka Nikaya, all the thousand, thousand, thousand suttas, everything Buddha's Dhamma taught. Everything Buddha Dhamma talk. He talk about meditation. So most of the suttas you'll find he talk about meditation. And most of the sutta are very deep. That's why you know the some monks when they, they don't understand, they skip that. They don't want to read that. And even though when people invite us, for me. I never delivered such a Dhamma talk to, to the people's house because they are, not, they are not ready to understand. We just explained them from the, uh, Dhammapada. One verse, uh, how to give the Dhamma, how to offer, if you do, you will gain merit, you know, and so on. We just said some sort of a story and they feel happy. Oh. Yeah, we did a lot of wholesome today. Happy. Finish. But if you tell them, okay, avijja pasaya sankara, sankara pasaya, we <laughs> they will never understand. <laughs> because they never practice meditation. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, when the Buddha said to the Sati, the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, monks, what do you think? Has this monk Sati, son of a fisherman, kindled even a spark of wisdom in this Dhamma and discipline? How could he, Venerable Sir? No, Venerable Sir. So all those monks said, No. When this was said, the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, sat silent. Dismayed. So dismayed mean, means feel distress. With shoulder drooping, that means his shoulder, his shoulder down, bent, and head down. Bloom. Bloom means to be sad. And without response, he was quiet. He said, "Oh, whatever I was." Teaching to others, this is wrong. Buddha understood my mind. Then knowing this, the Blessed One told him, Misguided man, you will be recognized by your own pernicious view. I shall question the monks on this matter. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, do you understand the Dhamma taught by me? As this monk Sati, son of a fisherman, does, when he misrepresents us by his wrong grabs and injures himself and stores up much demerit, no venerable sir. For in many discourses, many discourses the Blessed One has a state, a consciousness to be dependently reasoned, since without a condition there is no origination of consciousness. So Buddha is going to explain because of this, that one happened. Because of that, this one happened. So he's going to explain that now. No, Venerable Sir. So for in many discourses, the Blessed One has a state, consciousness, to be dependently reasoned, since without a 
with the condition there is no origination of consciousness. Good monks, you see. So when Buddha asked those monks, they explained very nicely. And Buddha said, good monks, it is good that you understand the Dhamma taught by me thus. For in many ways I have state consciousness to be dependently reason. Since with a condition there is no origination of consciousness, but this monk Sati, son of a fisherman, misrepresent us by his wrong grabs and injures himself in a strokes of much demerit. For this lead to the harm and suffering of this misguided man for a long time. So, the Buddha is going to explain now conditionality of consciousness. Monks, consciousness is reckoned, reckoned by the particular conditions dependent upon which it arises. When consciousness arises dependent on I and forms, it is reckoned as I consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on ear and sounds, it is reckoned as ear consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on nose and odors, it is reckoned that as nose consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on tongue and taste, it is reckoned as tongue consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on body and tangibles, it is reckoned as body consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the mind and mind objects, it is reckoned as mind consciousness. So now he is going to give some simile, upama in Pali. See, just as fire is reckoned by the particular condition depend on which it burns. When fire burns dependent on locks, it is reckoned as a lock, lock fire, L-O-G, lock fire. When fire burns dependent on fagots, it is reckoned as a fagot fire. When burn, when fire burns dependent on grass, it is reckoned as a grass, grass fire. When fire burns dependent on cow dung, it is reckoned as a cow dung fire. When fire burns dependent on shop, it is reckoned as a shop fire. When fire burns dependent on rubbish, it is reckoned as a rubbish fire. So too, Consciousness is reckoned by, by the particular condition dependent on which it arises. When consciousness arises dependent on I, I and form, it is reckoned as I consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on ear and sounds, it is reckoned as ear consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on nose and odors, it is reckoned as nose consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on tongue and taste, it is reckoned as tongue consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the body and tangibles, it is reckoned as body consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the mind and mind objects, it is reckoned as mind consciousness. So now Buddha is going to explain general questionnaire on being. So Buddha said, monks, do you see this has come to be? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, do you see its origination occurs with that as nutriment? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, do you see with the cessation of that nutriment? What has come to be is subject to cessation? Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? Has this come to be? Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? 
Does its origination occur with that as nutriment? Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, does doubt rise when one is uncertain thus? With the cessation of that nutriment, is what has come to be subject to cessation? Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, is doubt abandoned in one who sees as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? This, come, this has come to be, yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, is doubt abandoned in one who ceases as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment? Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, is doubt abandoned in one who ceases as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? With the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation? Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, are you thus free from doubt here? This has come to be? Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, are you thus free from doubt here? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment? Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, are you thus free from doubt here with the cessation of that nutriment? What has come to be is subject to cessation? Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? This has come to be? Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, has it been seen well by you as it actually is, with proper wisdom thus, its origination occurs with that as nutriment. Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, has it been seen well by you, as it actually is, with proper wisdom thus, with the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation? Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, purified and bright as this view is, if you adhere to it, cherish it, treasure it, treat it as a possession, would you then understand that the Dhamma has been taught as similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping? No, Venerable Sir. Monks, purified and bright as this view is, if you do not adhere to it, cherish it, treasure it, tra treat it as a possession, would you then understand that the Dhamma has been taught as similar to a raft, being for the purpose of a crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping? Yes, Venerable Sir. So now, Buddha is going to talk about nutriment and dependent origination. So after that, then we have to repeat from the paper, okay? So the Buddha said, Monks, there are these four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that already have come to be and for the support of those seeking a new existences. What for? Their physical food as nutriment, gross or subtle, contact as the second, mental formations as the third, and consciousness as the fourth. Now, monks, these four kinds of nutriment have what as their source, what as their origin, from what are they born and produced. These four kinds of nutriment have craving in their source, craving as their origin, craving are born and produced from craving. So what is the meaning of craving? Can I do that? Craving, I like it. I don't like it mine. Okay, so Buddha is going to talk about here 
These four kinds of nutriment have craving as their source, craving as their origin. They are born and produced from craving. The Buddha said, and this craving has what as its source, as their origin, from what are they born and produced? Craving has feeling as its source, feeling as their origin. They are born and produced from feeling. And this feeling has what as its source, what as its origin. From what are they born and produced? Feeling has contact as its source, contact as its origin. It is born and produced from contact. And this contact has what as its source, what as its origin. From what is it born and produced? Contact has the sixfold base as its source, sixfold base as its origin. It is born and produced from the sixfold base. And this sixfold base has what as its source what as their origin from what are they born and produced the sixfold base has mentality materiality as its source mentality materiality as its origin they are born and produced from mentality materiality and this mentality materiality has what as its source, what as their origin, from what are they born and produced. Mentality materiality has consciousness as its source, consciousness as its origin. It is born and produced from consciousness. And this consciousness has what as its source, what as their origin, from what are they born and produced? Consciousness has formations as its source, formations as its origin. It is born and <coughs> produced from formations. And these formations have as it, have what as their source, what as their origin, from what are they born and produced? Formations have ignorance as their source, ignorance as their origin. They are born and produced from ignorance. Now we have to repeat from the, from the Sutta. So here you can see Okay, so you can see here one thing they mentioned the purpose of this reciting is to learn the 12 links of dependent originations. Bhante reads through the, these sections, the first starting at page 349. So, a student has start with the bolded and underlined after Bhante start sentence. You understand, right? This one, mm -hmm. right? So monks with ignorance as condition, formation with formation as condition, consciousness with consciousness as condition, mentality with mentality maturity as condition, with the sixfold base as condition. With contact as conditioned, with feeling as conditioned, with craving as conditioned, with clinging as conditioned, 
with habitual tendency as condition, with birth as condition, such is the origin of this whole match of suffering. So now, the Buddha said, with birth as condition, aging and death comes to be. So it was said, now monks, do aging and death have birth as conditions or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With habitual tendency as conditions, birth comes to be. So it is said, now monks, does birth have habitual tendencies as conditions or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With clinging as condition, habitual tendencies come to be. So it was said, now monks, does habitual tendency have clinginess conditions or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With craviness conditions, clinging comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does clinging have craviness conditions or not? And how do you take it in this case? With the feeling as conditions, craving. Do you have. David, do you want to say something? Oh, I, I just itched my nose. Oh, I see. <laughs> Sorry. I thought that you raised the hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> With feeling as conditions, craving comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does craving come feeling as conditions or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With contact as condition, feeling comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does feeling have contact as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With a sixfold base as condition, contact comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does contact have this sixfold base as conditions or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With mentality, materiality as conditions, the sixfold base comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does the sixfold base have mentality, materiality as conditions or not? Or how do you take it in this case? The sixfold base has mentality, materiality as conditions or not. With consciousness as conditions, mentality, materiality come to be. So it was said, now monks, does mentality, materiality have consciousness as conditions or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With formations as conditions, consciousness comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does consciousness have formations as conditions or not? Or how do you take it in this case? 
When ignorance has conditions, a formation comes to be. So it is. It was said, now monks, do formations have ignorance as conditions or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Good monks, so you say thus, and I also say thus. When dicks exist, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. That is, with ignorance as conditioned, with formations as conditioned, with, form, with consciousness as conditioned, with mentality maturity as conditioned, with sixfold base as conditioned, with contact as conditioned, with feeling as conditioned, with craving as conditioned, with clinging as conditioned, with habitual tendencies as conditions, with birth as conditions, But with the remainderless uh, fading away and cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of for cessation of formation. With the cessation of formations comes the cessation of consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness comes the cessation of mentality. With the cessation of mentality materiality comes the cessation of sixfold With the cessation of the sixfold base comes the cessation of with the cessation of contact and comes the cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling comes the cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of tendencies. With the cessation of habitual tendencies it comes the cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth. Such is the cessation of, the, of this whole match of suffering. With the cessation of birth comes the cessation of aging and death. So it was said, now monks, do aging and death cease with the cessation of birth or not? How do you take it? In this case, With the cessation of habitual tendencies comes the cessation of birth. So it was said, now monks, does the birth cease with the cessation of habitual tendencies or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual tendencies. So it was said, now monks, do habitual tendencies cease with the cessation of clinging or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. So it was said, now monks, does the clinging cease with the cessation of craving or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of feeling comes the cessation of craving. So it was said, now monks, does the craving cease with the cessation of feeling or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With 
with the cessation of contact comes the cessation of feeling. So it was said, now monks, does the feeling cease with the cessation of contact or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of the sixfold base comes the cessation of contact. So it was said, now monks, does contact cease with the cessation of sixfold base or not? And how do you take it in this case? Contact ceases with the cessation of the sixfold base, Venerable Sir. Thus, we take it in this case. With the cessation of the sixfold base, the cessation of contact occurs. With the cessation of mentality, materiality, comes the cessation of the sixfold base. So it was said, now monks, does the sixfold base cease with the cessation of mentality, materiality, or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of consciousness comes the cessation of mentality materiality. So it was said, now monks, does the mentality materiality cease with the cessation of consciousness or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of formations comes the cessation of consciousness. So it was said, now monks, does the consciousness cease with the cessation of formation or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Consciousness ceases with the cessation of formation With the cessation of ignorance, comes the cessation of formations. So it was said, now monks, do formations cease with the cessation of ignorance or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Good monks, so you say thus, and I also say thus. When this does not exist, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. That is, with the cessation of ignorance, comes the cessation of formations. With the cessation of formations, comes the cessation of consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness, comes the cessation of mentality. With the cessation of mentality, materiality, comes the cessation of with the cessation of, of the sixfold, sixfold ways comes the cessation of contact. With the cessation of contact comes the cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling comes the cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual With the cessation of habitual tendencies comes the cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth. Monks, having uh, knowing and seen in this way, would you run back to the past thus? Were we in the past? Were we not in the past? What were we in the past? How were we in the past? Having been what? What did we become in the past? No, Venerable Sir. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you run forward to the future thus? Shall we be in the future? Shall we not be in the future? What shall we be in the future? How shall we be in the future? Having been what? What shall we become in the future? No, Venerable Sir. 
So knowing and seeing in this way, would you, would you now be inwardly perplexed about the present thus? Am I? Am I not? What am I? How am I? Where has this been come from? Where will I go? No, Venerable Sir. Monks, knowing and seeing in this way, would you speak thus? The teacher is respected by us. We speak as we do out of respect for the teacher. No, Venerable Sir. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you speak thus? The recluse says this, we, and we speak thus at the bearing for the recluse? No, Venerable Sir. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you acknowledge another teacher? No, Venerable Sir. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you return to the observances? To you, to you mo to mo to us. <laughs> to more to us. <laughs> to more to us debates. To more to us debates, auspicious signs of ordinary recluses and Brahmins, and taking them as the core of the holy life. No, Venerable Sir, do you speak only of what you have known, seen, and understood for yourself? Yes, Venerable Sir. Good monks, so you have been guided by me with this Dhamma. What is visible here and now? Immediately effective. Inviting inspections onward leading to be experienced by the wise for themselves. For it was with reference to this that it has been said, monks, this Dhamma is visible here and now. Immediately effective inviting inspections onward leading to be experienced by the wise for themselves. So you see, visible, you come and see a hipasiku, akaliku, that means immediately effective. So if you practice now, you will get result right, right now. That's why I always say to all of you, don't think past, don't think future, think right now, what you are doing. You are at Damasuka now, you forget home, you forget your children, you forget your beautiful wife, <laughs> you forget everything. <laughs> Ten days, don't think that, okay. <laughs> so you have to do, I have to focus the meditation. Buddha said my teaching is visible and immediately effective. So if you practice now, you will get result now. You see, beautiful advice. You see, he's saying to the monks, monks, the descents of the embryo, 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 right? Embryo, embryo means within womb, takes place through the union of three things. Here, there is the union of the mother and father, but the mother is not in season. But a common being is not present. In this case, no descent of an embryo take place. <laughs> Good. <laughs> embryo, right? Embryo. Huh? Embryo. Yo. Yo, yo. Embryo. Embryo take place. Here there is the union of the mother and father. The mother is in season, but the coming being is not present. In this case too, no descent of the embryo take pl takes place. But when there is the union of the mother and father, and the mother is in season, and the coming being is present, through the union of these three things, descents of the embryo 
takes place. The mother then carries the embryo in her own for nine or ten months with much anxiety as a heavy burden. It means you already know that. Then at the end of nine or ten months, the mother gives birth with much anxiety as a heavy burden. Then when the child is born, she nourishes it with her own blood. For the mother's breast milk is called blood in the noble swan discipline. When he grows up and his faculties mature, and the child plays at such games as tow plow, tip cart, tow wind wheels, tow measures, tow carts, a tow bow and arrow. This is, you know, some some the children play all those things they are talking about. When he grows up and his faculties mature, still further. The youth enjoys himself, provided and endowed with the five courts of sensual pleasure, with the forms cognizable by the eye that are wishes for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear that are wished for, desired, agreeable, likable, connected with sensual desire, and provoca prov provocative of lust. Orders are cognizable by the nose that are wished for, desired, agreeable, likable, connected with sensual desire, provocative of lust. Flowers cognizable by the tongue that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. So now Buddha is going to talk about the con continuations of the round. On seeing a form with the eye, he lusts after it, if it is pleasant. He dislikes it, if it is unpleasant. So that's why we said, you know, the craving is, I like it, I don't like it, mine. He avoids with mindfulness unestablished with a limited mind, and he does not understand as it actually is the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom, wherein those evil unwholesome states cease with a remainder. Engaged as he is in favoring and opposing whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, he delights in that feeling, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. As he does so, delight rises in him. Now delight in feeling is craving. With craving as conditions, clinging comes to be. With the his clanginess condition, habitual tendencies comes to be. With habitual tendency as conditions, birth comes to be. With the birth as conditions, aging and death, sorrow, lamentations, pain, grief and despair come to be. On hearing a sound with the ear, he lusts after it. If it is pleasant, he dislikes it if it is unpleasant. He avoids the mindfulness unestablished with a limited mind, and he does not understand as it actually is, 
the deliverance of mind and the deliverance by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states cease with a remainder, engaged as he is in favoring and opposing whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, he delights in that feeling, welcomes it, and remains so holding to it. As he does so, delight rises in him. So delight in feelings is craving. With craving as conditions, clinging comes to be. With his clinging as condition, habitual tendencies comes to be. With habitual tendencies as condition, birth comes to be. With birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentations, pain, grief and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. On a smelling as an order with the nose, he lusts after it. If it is pleasant, he dislikes it. If it is unpleasant, he avoids with mindfulness unestablished, with a limited mind. He does not understand as it actually is the deliverance of mind and a deliverance by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states cease with a remainder. Engaged as he is in favoring and opposing whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, he relies in that feeling, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. As he does so, delight rises in him. Now delight in feeling is craving. With craving as condition, clanging comes to be. With his clanging as condition, habitual tendencies comes to be. With habitual tendency as condition, birth comes to be. With birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole match of suffering. So he's going to talk about taste and flavor. On tasting a flavor with the tongue, he lost after it. If it is pleasant, he dislikes it. If it is unpleasant, he avoids with the mindfulness unestablished with a limit mind. And he does not understand as it actually is the deliverance of mind and then deliverance by wisdom, wherein in those evil and wholesome states cease with the remainder, engaged as he is in favoring and opposing whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, he delights in that feeling, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. As he does so, Delight rises in him. Now, delight in feeling is craving. With craving as condition, clanging comes to be. With his clanging as condition, habitual tendencies comes to be. With habitual tendencies as condition, birth comes to be. With the birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole match of suffering. So now he's going to explain touch and a tangible body. On touching a tangible of the body, he lasts after it. If it is pleasant, he dislikes it if it is unpleasant. He avoids with the mindfulness unestablished with a limit, limited mind, and he does not understand it <coughs> as it actually is the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states cease with the remainder, engaged as he is in favoring and opposing whatever feeling he feels, 
whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, he, dis he delights in that feeling, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. As he does so, delight rises in him. Now, delight in feeling is craving. With craviness condition, clanging comes to be. With his clanginess condition, habitual tendencies comes to be. With habitual tendencies as condition, birth comes to be. With birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentations, pain, grief and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole match of suffering. So now he's going to talk about cognizing a mind object with the mind. On cognizing a mind object with the mind, he lusts after it if it is pleasant. He dislikes it if it is unpleasant. He avoids with the mi mindfulness unestablished with a limited mind, and he does not understand as it actually is the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states cease with a remainder. Engaged as he is in favoring and opposing whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, he delights in that feeling, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. As he does so, delight rises in him. Now delight in a feeling is craving. With a craviness condition, clinging comes to be. With his clinginess condition, habitual tendencies come to be. With the habitual tendencies condition, birth comes to be. With the birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. Now Buddha is going to talk about the ending of the round the gradual training. Here monks, a Tathagata appears in the world, accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of the worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. He declares this world with its gods, its maras, so maras means evil one, and its brahmins, these generations with its recluses and brahmin, its princes and its people, which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end with the right meaning and praising, and he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. A householder or a householder's son, or one born in some other clan, hears the Dhamma. On hearing the Dhamma, acquires the faith in the Tathagata. Possessing that faith, he considers thus, householder's life is crowded and dusty, life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy while living at home to lead to the home life utterly perfect and pure as a foolish shell. Suppose I shape up my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. On a later occasions, abandoning a small or a large fortune, abandoning a small or large cycle of friends and relatives, he shaves off his hair and beard, puts on the yellow robe, and goes forth from the home life into homelessness. It's not easy actually to become monk when you have the family, you know. 
when you have children, when you have beautiful wife, when you have relatives, it's not easy, right? But to some people, this is very unfortunate actually. The who else who sacrifice their, their life, you know, and they they stay as a as a monk forever at the monastery. That some the bad people they always criticize the poor monks. So I tell them, okay, well, we are bad monk. You are going to criticize about us. We are very bad. So please come and they wear the robe and stay with me. They'll never do that. When I speak like that, they're quiet because they cannot sacrifice that. Even one week they will not be able to stay at their monastery because they have craving, attachment about the wife, children, family. Right? It's very strong. Okay, well, you are a good person and you get ordination and stay here. We, are, we will disrupt. We will go, go out. Then they are quiet. We are facing such a problem, you know, in different places. That's why the people who never keep the precept. So you criticize about the monks. All the time you, have, you break up the precept. You are doing unwholesome action. And because of that unwholesome, the Buddha said, it will lead to your harm for a long time. You suffer for that. They don't believe that. Even though they are Buddhist. You know, Buddha said, keep the only five precepts. That's all. Only five. Buddhist people, even many Buddhist people, they, they cannot keep the five precepts. In this country, yes. I have a question. I know in Mahayana, there's a tradition that the lay people cannot say anything about the monks. Is it true with the Theravada tradition? Yeah. Uh, Mahayana cannot say that, right? Yeah, you cannot. It's, 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 a, it's considered a very serious uh, offense. Uh, as a lay person, you judge on the monks. We cannot do anything like that. A few, um, few weeks ago, do you know what happened in my country? The lay people hit the monk. Because they want to control the monastery. They want to be the leader of the monastery. So lay people cannot do that. They, they have money, they don't know, I am the big guy. Everybody should listen to me. I'll control the monk. So when you go to Myanmar in Thailand, you never see that. The monastery led by the Sangha. The Sangha keep the precept, they practice the Dhamma, you know, they practice meditation at the monastery. You know, your duty is for offering dana, that's all. And come to listen Dhamma. So because of that, a lot of bad things is happening, you know. So that's why Buddha said, oh monks, wherever, any temple, when you stay there, if you see some politics, some problem, please leave the temple. Go to another place where it's a quiet place. You have arms bowl close to the any village, go there and stay there under the tree and when it's time for going for arms round, go there and then collect the food, come back after taking lunch, meditate. You know? So Buddha said that way. So that's why it's a, a lot of bad things happening. The householder, they never keep the precept, 
but try to control the monks. Long time ago, when I came, 2008, in New York, one guy said, the Bhante's duty is for giving the only five preset. He should not involve with any, any things here. He has stayed here, eating, sleeping, and giving the five preset. That's all. <laughs> so that's why we should not do that way. That way, you see, they are not keeping the five preset, and they are gossiping, gossiping, criticizing, criticizing, who are working for the Dhamma. As you say in the Mahayana, it's a, it's a big offense. And even Taha was also a big offense. One way you are not keeping the precept, and on the other hand, you are criticizing the monks who are observing, who are practicing 227 rules. So, do you think what the kinds of unwholesome action you are doing, you are doing big offense. So for that you have to suffer. I saw practically the people, you know one day I went one place, there is, you know, there are monks, some monks, they allow the people to sit close to them. When the people invite us, monks sit have to be higher and people sit down. This is according to the Buddhism, Buddhist culture. The people, especially in my country, so who are Buddhist, who really know Buddhism, when you go in Burma and Thailand, you'll see. The lay people never sit with the monks, same level. But when I was in New York, long time ago, many years ago, I'm talking 16 years ago, you know. I went to one place, because they invited us actually, and then I went there. One guy, he sat close to the banner, one venerable, one bante. Because I, he's senior than me, I have to respect him, right? And that guy, he said like this. So how can I respect him? But anyway, I respect him. So that guy committed offense. After a few years, he got a bone cancer and passed away. Very soon. You know? Because they don't know. The one monk come here and he's respecting the senior monk. And that monk also didn't tell him, you go down and sit down because he's, he's going to respect me. He didn't tell him anything because he doesn't have any idea about the discipline rules. Even though he's senior monk, but he's not highly educated monk. He should, he's, he should tell him, right? Okay, go down. He is going to respect me, but he didn't do that. And that guy is arrogant. He doesn't want to sit down. So I respect him. I think, okay, this is his karma. I don't care. He's senior monk. I have to respect him. I bow three times. Very practically I saw, because of the unwholesome actions, he passed away within short time. Immediately he got the bone cancer and after a few days, after a few months, gone. So that's why, you know, karma, when will come bad karma to you, you don't know. So that's why Buddha said, O monks, please keep the precept, practice the Dhamma all the time. If you talk with somebody, you have to be mindful. Very mindful. Don't gossip. 
don't talk something negative which will harm you and you suffer for a long time so try to be mindful all the time this is the Buddha's great advice he said that way whenever you read the suttas you'll find that way you know even at present we are suffering that when you give when you preach Dhamma some people sit like that you know the great come came here from the Canada right so he when I was taking the breakfast I think breakfast or lunch he sat with me I didn't tell him anything directly because if I tell him he feel insulted you know so I said sister in the dining hall inside of the dining hall and the uh, uh, kitchen I said sister could you explain him even Samanara cannot sit with me Samanara cannot sit with the man cannot take a lunch this is discipline role so I, I explained sister and then okay okay Bhante, no problem I will explain him she explained very nicely to Greg and he understood this is the way how to understand each other, right? And I was very happy. All the novices separately and then Sister and David, Greg, they said one place, beautiful. This is the rules. This is the discipline rule. This is the Vinaya. So when I was in Burma, long, uh, I mean, 2002 I went in Myanmar 2001 and then I got a novice ordination in Bangladesh and went to Myanmar so at the International Theravada Buddhist Mission University most of the students monks only only few students are I think two or three in my in my class two or three Samanera the senior mom when we go to take breakfast and lunch they never allow us to, for sitting with the monks because that time we don't know Vinaya we, we, we sat with the monks he said hey are you Samanera Yes. Okay. Stand up. Stand up. Go that you should sit separately. You cannot sit with the monks. Monk have to be in one table five monks. Another table five monks. Someone and I have to be separate. This is the rules. In Thailand more strict. You know? When you do the Kamavasa reciting, the full moon day. And when we do the Upasampada full ordination, Samanara will not be, Samanara cannot go there. Not allowed. Only monk can go there. You know? So that's why we explain because the, I have a lot of experience, then you know, we don't want to, we don't want to say some, somebody you know, who, who feel who don't feel good you know because he came here from far away you know about 20 hours motorcycle you know and then he come here and uh, so if we say hey great you cannot sit here you go to the other place he will feel very bad so that why also I also have the unwholesome action verbally right and I said because we are practicing loving kindness, meditation. So I said gently to our sister. Sister said very nicely, and they understood. This is the way how to explain other. You know, I try to do that, but still some people they don't under, they, they they never follow me. But it's fine. It's okay. We cannot change the people. They are very rude. You know, some people are dead. They don't want to listen to you. Anyway. So here, a householder and a householder's sons are one 
born in some other clan hears the Dhamma and hears the Dhamma acquires faith in the Tathagata. Possessing that faith, he considered thus. Householder's life is crowded and dusty. Life gone for, I think this one I already read. Yeah. Having thus gone forth and possessing the monk's training and way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings, he has strength from the living beings. Now he is going to talk about the five, five precepts. You know, so what are the five precepts? You already know. Abstention from killing, abstention from taking what is not given, abstention from adultery, and abstention from telling lies, abstention from drinking alcohol. You know? So here adultery means you have wife, but you do you do sexual activity with other partner. This is you break up the precept. You should not do that. So he is going to talk about here. Having thus gone forth and possessing the man's training and way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings, he have extension from killing living beings with the rod and weapon laid aside, gentle and kindly, he have various compassionate to all living beings, abandoning the taking of what is not given, he have extension from taking what is not given, taking only what is given, expecting only what is given, not stealing, he avoids the he avoids in purity, abandoning in celibacy, 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 in celibacy, in celibacy, he observes celibacy, living apart, abstention from vulgar practice of sexual intercourse. So here the Buddha is talking about this one is only for monks, not for lay people. Please remember this is for monks, not lay practitioners. It is a personal decision for everyone, but it is required for monks to act this way. Abandoning false speech, he has extension from false speech. He speaks truth. Adhere to truth is trustworthy and reliable one who is no deceiver of the world. Abandoning malicious speech, he abstains from malicious speech. He does not repeat elsewhere what he has heard in order to divide those people from this. Nor does he repeat to these people from those. Thus he is one who reunites those who are divided. A promoter of friendship who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, a speaker of words that promote concord. Abandoning hearts speech, cursing and swearing. He has strength from harsh speech. He speaks words as are gentle, pleasing to ear and lovable as good to the heart, are courteous, desired by many and agreeable to many. Abandoning gossip, he has strength from gossip. He speaks at the night, right time. He speaks what is fact speaks on what is good, he speaks on the Dhamma and discipline. At that right time, he speaks such words as are worth recording, reasonable, moderate, and beneficial. He abstains from injuring seeds and plants. He practices eating only one meal a day. I was straining from eating at night and outside the proper time. He was from dancing, singing, music and theatrical shows. 
He abstains from wearing garlands, asmiring himself, and with a sense, psh, 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 you cannot use that. No good for the monk. Okay? And embellishing himself with unguents. He abstains from high and large courses. He abstains from accepting gold and silver. He abstains from accepting raw grain. He abstains from accepting raw meat. He abstains from accepting women and girls. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Buddha was a very handsome boy. He's a handsome, handsome guy, you know. During the Buddha's time, one woman, she was so beautiful. All the king want to get her, you know. Everyone want to sleep with her. And she was very, very beautiful. And her father was thinking that, Oh, Buddha is the very handsome guy. I can offer my girl only to the Buddha. So that time Buddha was practicing meditation, you know, in the forest. And that girl and her father went to the Buddha where Buddha was practicing meditation. When they were in front of him, he opened his eyes and then he said, How can I help you? He said, Buddha, you are very handsome. You are very handsome boy, you know. My daughter doesn't want to marry other guys. They, I got a many offering actually. Many, many boy came uh, to, to get a marry with my girl, but she doesn't want to marry with anyone because she is very beautiful. And I think only you are the proper guy who can be husband of my wife. So I am. Please get a marry with my wife, with my with my daughter. And then Buddha said, "Sorry, I cannot accept whatever you said, because that time Buddha already got an enlightenment, right? All the desire gone, no desire in his mind, everything gone. And that girl was very angry." She was very angry. He said, I have to see you. You rejected me. <laughs> so she also made the problem with the Buddha, you know, because of that. So he abstained from accepting men and women slaves. He abstained from accepting goats and sheep. He abstained from accepting fall and pigs. He abstained from accepting elephants, cattle, horses, and mares. He abstains from accepting fields and land. He abstained from going on errands and running messages. He abstained from buying and shelling. He abstained from false weight, false metals, and false measures. He abstained from cheating, deceiving, defrauding and trickery. He abstained from warning, murdering, binding, brigandage, plunder and violence. So he becomes content with ropes to protect this bo his body and with arms food to maintain his stomach and wherever he goes he sets out taking only this with him just as a bird wherever it goes flies with its wings as it only burdened so too the man becomes content with ropes to protect his body and with arms food to maintain his stomach and wherever he goes, he sits on taking only this with him, possessing this aggregate of noble virtue, that means precept. 
he experiences within himself a bliss that is blameless. On seeing a form with the eye, he does not grasp it at its sign and features, since if he left the eye faculties unguarded, evil and wholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices the way of is restraint. He guards the eye faculty. He understands the restraint of the eye faculty. On hearing a sound with the ear, he does not grasp at its signs and features. Since if he let the ear faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices the way of its restraint. He guards the ear faculty. He understands the restraints of the ear faculty. On a smelling an odor with the nose, he does not grasp it, its signs and features. Since if he let the nose faculties unguarded, evil and wholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices the way of its restraint. He guards nose faculties. He understands the restraints of the nose faculties. On tasting a flavor with the tongue, he does not grasp it, its signs and features. Since if he left the tongue faculty unguarded, evil and wholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He and practices the way of its restraint. He guards the tongue faculty. He understands the strength of the tongue faculty. On touching a tangible of the body, he does not grasp at its signs and features. Since if he let the body faculty unguarded, evil and wholesome state of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices the way of its restraint. He guards the body faculty. He undertakes the restraints of the body faculty. On cognizing a mind object with the mind, he does not grasp it, its signs and features. Since if he let the mind faculty anger it, even unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices the way of its restraint. He guards the mind faculty. He undertakes the restraints of the mind faculty. Possessing this noble restraint of the faculties, he experiences within him a bliss that is unsolid. He becomes one who acts in full awareness when going. Hello, what happened? Anything problem? Are you okay? Of course, the battery is going to stop in the last half of the talk. Oh, the sutra is almost done. I know. Yeah, you want to change it? Dukkha. Oh, dukkha, dukkha, right? Dukkha, dukkha. So here. Yeah, just oh, battery is gone. Yeah. But sutra is not gone yet. Sutra is not finished 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 yet. We are almost finished actually. The sutta is almost. It gives more nutriment. Yeah. Now it's good. Oh, okay. now it's uh, better. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Possessing this noble restraint of the faculty, he experiences within himself a bliss that is uh, unsolid. He becomes one who has in full awareness when going forward and returning who errs in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away, who errs in full awareness when flexing and standing his limbs, who errs in full awareness when wearing his robe and carrying his outer robe and bowl, 
who wears in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting, who wears in full awareness when defecating and urinating, who wears in full awareness when walking, standing, seating, falling asleep, waking up, talking and keeping silent. You see, like Mahasati Patana Sutta. So those things they are talking about here. This is from Sutta number 10. So full awareness of what mind's attention is doing with each of this action. This is called the full, full awareness. I repeat again. Full awareness of what mind's attention is doing with each of these action. This is called the full awareness. Possessing this aggregate of noble virtue and this noble restraint of the faculties and possessing this noble mindfulness and full awareness, he resort to a, a, a secluded resting place, that means monastery. The forest the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a channel ground, a jungle ticket, an open space, a heat of a straw. You know, during the Buddha's time, some monks went to the, the channel ground and some monks went in the cave, some went to the, under the tree, some went to the empty heart. Well, whatever you want, you like to, wherever you want to go, you can go for practicing meditation. The most important is your meditation, you know. Wherever you feel comfortable. That's why when you teach um, to others, especially to him, and in New York or here, we always say sit comfortably, relax, wherever you want to sit. But the most important is you sitting, sit, have to sit comfortably. If you just sit very hard, strict, you know, but you meditate, you'll get a lot of hindrances will arise in your mind. You will be so tired, you know. Don't be serious practitioner. If you think that I am serious meditation, don't talk with me. So that one doesn't work, <laughs> you know. Yeah. When I was in Myanmar Mahasi Meditation Center, one I met one Chinese monk. He was uh, junior than me. After many many years, I met him in New York. He's from Taiwan, actually Taiwan or China, I think, but he's a U.S. citizen, and he was living in New Jersey. So. I, I met with him 2002, I think, 2002. You know, he's from United States. In the boat we saw, he's from America. So our English is no good that time because we want to improve our English. We want to say, hello, Mantea, how are you? Nice to see you, you know. so. Because he's from America, we thought that he, he, he knows very good English. That's why we want to talk with him to improve our English, you know. I said, don't disturb me. Oh, don't talk with me. He said, okay, no problem. After many, many years, I met him in New York. And he said, hello, Bante, how are you? Oh, you look different now. You see? So that's why we are as a loving kindness practitioner, especially who never practice loving kindness. At the beginning we teach them, radiate loving kindness to yourself. You have to love yourself first. If you cannot love yourself, how can you love other people? Right? That's why radiate loving kindness to yourself 10 minutes. And then choose a spiritual friend who is really very helpful to you, who really respect you. 
shows him true radiant loving kindness. That way you are in first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. Then you do the six directions. So this is the way. So when somebody gets a fourth jhana, oh, they are a beautiful guy. That state is beautiful abiding. Right? Who is the Subhananda? Ah, oh, yes, so. <laughs> so beautiful abiding. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you'll see who really understand the, uh, the fourth jhana they never show that they are, don't disturb me I am the serious practitioner you know they never say that someone want to speak with me with their smile with their loving kindness talk with them I always teach to the, I always say to the meditators, you know, in New York, you are the loving kindness practitioner. You come here every Friday for practicing meditation, right? Okay. Whenever you go outside, if you see somebody, you say first, hi, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because you are loving kindness practitioner. Don't expect from them, he should tell me hi, hello first. Don't expect that way. If you expect that way, you are not really a good practitioner. You are not loving kindness practitioner. They are doing that way. This is the way, you know. So when I came here second time, I met many meditators here. I think second time, for 10 days retreat, I came here first time 4 months, second time 10 days. So many meditators, lay, lay people, you know, after Dhamma talk, after money, uh, accepting the 8 precepts, I get the, I give 8 precepts almost every day to the meditators. And when I go in dining hall and practicing with the others, you know, whenever they see me, they said, Bhante, one guy said, I never see the happy monk like you. You are the only happiest one. All the time you smile with everyone. And then I took pictures with him, you know. And he also smiled, I told him, okay, smile with me. And he smiled with me and he made that pictures very nicely and then he put over there. You see that? <laughs> yeah. So he said, Bhante, you are smiling uh, pictures. I make it very nicely. And the next time when I go to Damasuka, I'll offer this one to David. And I'll tell him to put in the Dhamma hall. And he did. <laughs> so you see, this is the practical story. Possessing this agreeable of noble virtue and this noble restraint of the faculties and possessing this noble mindfulness and full awareness, he resort to a secluded resting place. The forest and root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a channel ground, a jungle ticket, as an open space, a heap of a straw, on returning from his arms round, after his meal he sits down, folding his legs crosswise, sitting his body erect, and establishing mindfulness before him. Abandoning covetousness for the world, he avoids with a mind free from covetousness. He purifies his mind from covetousness, that means greed, abandoning ill will. So now he is going to talk about five hindrances, you know. Abandoning ill will and hatred, he avoids with the mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. He purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. Abandoning sloth and torpor, or the sleepiness and dullness, 
he avoids the free from sleepiness and dullness. Mindful and fully aware, he purifies his mind from sleepiness and dullness. Abandon restlessness and anxiety, he avoids unagitated with a mind in worldly peaceful. He purifies his mind from restless anxiety. Abandoning doubt, he avoids having gone beyond doubt and perplexed about wholesome states. He purifies his mind from doubt. Having thus abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, wisdom arose in his mind. And he is not going to talk about in the suttas, the first jana, second jana, third jana, and fourth jana. You see, this is the way how Buddha is teaching. Quite secluded from sensual pleasure, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and avoids in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought, joy and happiness born of seclusion. You already understand, this is the characteristic of the first jhana, right? With the stilling of thinking and examining thought, he enters upon and avoids in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and stillness of mind, with joy and happiness born of collectedness. So, when you attain the second jhana, you will have the self-confidence. Wow! This meditation is really work. So, that confidence will arise. That's what Buddha said, who, which, uh, which has self-confidence. With the fairy way as well of joy, the meditator avoids in equanimity, is mindful and fully aware, is still feeling happiness with the body, the enter upon avoided in the third jhana, on account of which nobles once announced, one has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a meditator enters and abides in the fourth jhana, so which has neither painful nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. So this talk about Buddha, first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, and fourth jhana, Sutruda, by practicing loving kindness to yourself and to your spiritual friend, we can get it. Right? First jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. Now Buddha is going to talk about the ending of the round, the full cessation, the full cessation. On seeing a form with the eye, it does not lust after it, if it is pleasant. It does not dislike it, if it is unpleasing. He avoids with mindfulness established with an immeasurable mind. And he understands, as it actually is, that the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states cease with, without rema remainder. Having thus abandoned, favoring and opposing whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, he does not delight in that feeling, welcome it or remain holding to it, as he does not do so. Delight in feelings ceases in him, with the cessation of his delight comes cessation of craving, with the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. At that moment, I remember Bhante V, you know. So when he sit here, when he delivered this Dhamma talk, the cessation of this and cessation of that, with the cessation of this and cessation of that, his sound is still appearing in my ear, you know. So wonderful. So with the cessation of habitual tendencies comes the cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, grief, pain, grief, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. On hearing the sound with the ear, 
it does not last after it if it is pleasing. He does not dislike it if it is unpleasing. He avers with mindfulness established with a immeasurable mind. And he understands as it actually is the deliverance of mind and the deliverance by wisdom, wherein those evil unwholesome states cease without reminder. Having thus abandoned favoring and opposing whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither pleasant nor pleasant, he does not delight in that feeling, welcome it, or remain to hold it to it, as he does not do so. Delight in feeling ceases in him. With the cessation of his delight comes the cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual tendencies. With the cessation of habitual tendencies comes the cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, the aging and death, sorrow, lamentations, pain, grief, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole match of suffering. On a smelling and odor with the nose, it does not last after it if it is pleasant. He does not dislike it if it is unpleasant. He avoids with mindfulness established with an immeasurable mind, and he understands as it actually is the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states cease with a reminder. Having thus abandoned favoring and opposing, Whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, he does not delight in that feeling, welcome it, or remain holding to it, as he does not do so. Delight in feeling ceases in him. With the cessation of his delight comes the cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual tendency. With the cessation of habitual tendency comes the cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole match of suffering. You know, when the Bhante, we deliver Tamma talk, the different originations, even though he was almost 80, 80 years, I think when I came here, he was 77 that time. When he delivered Dhamma talk, a strong energy arise in his mind. Even though he is 77 years old, I saw his mind have a strong energy when he read Defender Ordination Sutta. This is what I saw practically, you know. Even I am very young, I am still getting tired now. <laughs> so I think he was very strong guy, you know. <laughs> he never tired. Reading, 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 explaining. Wow. I was thinking, how did he get this as a power? Never tired, you know? On tasting a flavor with the tongue, he does not last after it if it is pleasing. He does not dislike it if it is unpleasing. He avoids with mindfulness established with an immeasurable mind, and he understands as it actually is the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom, wherein in those evil unwholesome states cease without remainder. Having thus abandoned favoring and opposing whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, 
He does not delight in that feeling, welcome it or remain holding to it. As he does not do so, delight in feeling ceases in him. With the cessation of his delight comes the cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual tendencies. With the cessation of habitual tendency comes the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. On touching a tangible of the body, he does not last after it if it is pleasing. He does not dislike it if it is unpleasing. He avoids the mindfulness established with an immeasurable mind and he understands as it actually is the deliverance of mind and the deliverance by wisdom wherein those evil and wholesome states cease with the remainder. Having thus abandoned uh, favoring and opposing, whatever feelings he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, he does not delight in that feeling, welcome it or remain holding to it, as he does not do so, delight in feeling ceases in him. With the ceases of his delight comes the cessation of craving, with the cessation of cravings comes the cessation of clinging, with the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual tendencies. With the cessation of habitual tendencies comes the cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentations, pain, grief and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. The last. On cognizing a mind object with a mind, he does not last after it if it is pleasing. He does not dislike it if it is unpleasing. He avoids with the mindfulness established with an immeasurable mind, and he understands as it actually is the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states cease with a remainder. Having thus abandoned uh, favoring and opposing whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, nor or neither painful nor pleasant, he does not delight in that feeling, welcome it or remain holding to it. As he does not do so, delight in feeling ceases in him. With the cessation of his delight comes the cessation of craving. With the cessation of cravings comes the cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual tendencies. With the cessation of habitual tendencies come the cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentations, pain, grief and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Conclusion. Finish. Almost. Yeah. Months. Remember this deliverance in the distractions of craving as taught in brief by me. But remember, the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, as caught up in a vast net of craving, in the trivial of craving. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One words. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Finish. Yeah, I said it will take more than two hours now. Yeah, two hours, almost 20 minutes. Right? Tonight, no question, right? <laughs> you, <laughs> you still have? You still have? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Can you just give me a distinction, the difference between deliverance of mind and deliverance of wisdom? 
delivering wisdom means he understood different origination. Right? David? Yeah. yeah. Deliverer of wisdom means he saw the different origination. He every link he understood. This is the deliverer of the wisdom. That's why Buddha said in the Sutta number 111, Sariputta has wisdom. Sariputta is wise. You know? So wise Sariputta has wisdom. That means he could understand all the link of dependent origination. And all the link of dependent origination have the vulnerable truths. You'll see that. Right? I'm going to guess that that's all the Hijans. All the time. The base of infinite, neither perception nor any perception. From, from first jhana to, according to David's explanation, from first jhana to the base of neither perception nor non perceptions. Yeah, that's why he said deliberate of the mind. That makes sense to me. That's what I thought. So you got it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. So, yes. I have a minor question. So in the section on nutriment, they talk about gross food and subtle food, and I've never actually heard anybody define what subtle food is. Oh, oh I have. Yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I have. Uh, Bhante said subtle food is from the day after. Oh, okay. Good. Thank you, because I'm... You're answering that, all the questions. Very good. I appreciate it. <laughs> We have heard this a lot, this sutta. Hmm? We have heard this sutta many times. Yeah. So, do we have any questions? This is the good things that, <clears throat> this is the first time I delivered Dhamma talk, this sutta, in my Hmong life. You know, I don't know, I explain good or bad. <laughs> so, if David said good, Good. <laughs> Number one or two? <laughs> Twelve. <laughs> so, so, so when I when I was uh, reading the sutta, I was remembering uh, some things. The how Bante uh, read the sutta, and he explained. So I was remembering him, you know. But anyway, he did also great things. Because of him, a lot of people understand, understood Dhamma, and we are practicing, we are still practicing, you know. So that's why we also practice ourselves and also teach to others, so that they also, when they are qualified, they also can teach to others. That way, this practice will spread around the world. Right? So my last suggestion is um, to all of you must last advice. Tomorrow everybody come here six o'clock and please bring you your cloth, your dress, your layperson dress. So but don't don't wear your labor and dress before coming here. Okay. After coming here, you reset some you reset some polytom with me. Ahang bante dasa silang nikkepami attanga silang samadhiyami. That means ahang means I am bante. I am give up. I am going to give up 10 preset and I would like to accept the 8 preset. Please give me the 8 preset. Say three times and then I will tell you, okay, you can change now. Then you change and you come here. After coming, then I will give you some instruction. The, in the morning, we reset. Buddhaṁ saranaṁ gacchāmi, dhammaṁ saranaṁ gacchāmi. I now take refuge in the Buddha. I now take refuge in the Dhamma. I now take refuge in the Sangha. Then you accept the eight precepts. 
so tomorrow whole day you can practice meditation here as a lay person right and then Saturday morning or tomorrow Mathananda is going to give the talk tomorrow evening and then Saturday evening so before leaving please give up the eight precept and accept the five precept without give up the giving up uh, eight precept please don't leave okay so the Mathananda will be here and Upakananda will be here so they will not disrupt so they will they, will, they want they determined to become monk so I'm going to help them to become monk so they'll go together in New York so close to my center there is one Burmese monastery they have Shima Hall and I also went to invite the Sangha for ordaining them so that's why they'll be here They'll, they will accept the ten precept in the morning and all of you give up the ten precept and accept the eight precept and Saturday give up the eight precept by Mathananda and then accept the five precept right and after that so you can leave right so I yeah, I said it this uh, morning every, to everyone. So you practice here 10 days and whatever you have experienced, please try to practice at home. So this practice is just you come here and then you practice 10 days. So when you go back at home, you forgo, forget it. That way you go down again. So if you want to gain the same stage it will take time you have to practice again a long time you know so at least try to practice one hour who can sit five hours six hours or who, who said the two hours four hours three hours at least try to sit one hour at home and if you think that I don't have time, even one hour I cannot see because I have to go to work. Please sit 30 minutes. Try to sit 30 minutes because this practice is not less than 30 minutes. You can practice more than that but not less than 30 minutes. Right? So and if you have any questions, you can email to me or you can email to David or sister so we are going to help you right we are Kalayana Metta right yes oh I was thinking where are you now oh, oh you here right we are Kalayana Metta that means we are all friends you see 10 days how nicely we stay here. We never see any anger from any people. Beautiful. Right? We are helping each other. Take breakfast, take lunch. Bhante, can I help you? Can I help you? Okay, I'm going to wash your, take your plate. Very nice. This is the way how to practice loving kindness. Brahma Vihara. We have to practice that way. This is the way how to live harmoniously. You know, that's why Buddha said, O oh monks, Kalayana Metta. We are all friends. You know, during the Buddha's times, one monk was sick. In his body, you know, different. How do you say that in English, David, you know, many things, box, and box yeah, no. and the bad, is, is, a bad smell is coming from his body, and the other monks didn't go to him, because the, the bad smell from his body, and nobody took care of him, you know, 
and Buddha heard and Buddha when Buddha heard and he called all the monks oh monks okay please follow me and they went to him and somebody uh, make the hot water and Buddha take the one um, one towel and just clean his body all the bad smell gone so after killing he that monk felt better you know and Buddha said oh monks you should not you should not stay I mean if somebody have the problem if somebody have disease you should not go away you should take care of them if somebody take care another monks he is really my son if any monk never help another monk you cannot be my son because we, you have to think we are all the same family so we stay here in this the Dhammasukha meditation center 10 days we like one family right we stay together and then we took a lunch together breakfast together practice meditation together very nice this is the way how to live together in the monastery the meditation center you know this is the what the Buddha said no conflict but we didn't see here everybody is smiling we never see anger because we talk about unwholesome 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 many times so who became little bit anger and he understood oh this is unwholesome maybe I break up the precept the mind will tell you hey you become angry a little bit so he or she feel guilty please forgive me Bhante you, you accept you receive the 10 precept again then you purify you never feel guilty that's why every morning we wake up 5 o'clock and we came here 6 o'clock to accept the ten precept. The precept will remind you that I am pure now. In the scripture Buddha said Sabba Papasa Karanam Kusalasa Upasampada Sa Sitta Pariyudapanam Etan Buddhana Sasana only two lines the whole scriptures only two lines sabba papa sakaranam means not to do any evil kusala saupasampada to cultivate wholesome sa means yourself sitta means mind Sasitta Pariyudapanam to purify one you to purify one's mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. This is the Dhamma. You see, so wonderful, right? So if we practice that way, then we understand Dhamma very well. Anyway, so let us share the merit together. May suffering once be suffering free and the fearless strike fearless be. May the grief be shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all be share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. 
May beings inhabiting a space in Narada, devils and Nagas of mighty power, share these merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.